So, herzlich willkommen zu unserer zweiten Folge unserer Online-Seminarreihe. Welcome everybody to our second session on climate lies. We want to talk about how right-wing populists and conspiracy groups use climate lies in the German debate and what are the implications for climate activists and politicians. Today, I would like to welcome Clara Duvigno, climate justice activist representing Fridays for Future, Alexandra Gese, MEP and Vice President of the Greens EFA Group in Brussels, and Katharina Schulz, Chairwoman of the Green Parliamentary Group, Bavarian State Parliament. I'm Soda Siebert, Head of the EU Democracy and Digital Policy Program, Heinrich Böll Foundation in Brussels, and I will present this meeting to you. The Heinrich Böll Stifting is the green political foundation. We are acting on a worldwide level for gender equality, democracy, and justice. Uh, the online seminar series was planned together with my great colleagues in Berlin, Katharina Klappek and Verin Meyer. This event will be recorded, uh, recorded and made available on YouTube afterwards. There will also be a simultaneous interpretation into English. Just press the small globe at the bottom of the screen and select English. There are also subtitles for deaf and hearing impaired people. Please ask your questions via the Q&A function. And something on how we're going to move on. We are going to start with Clara Duvigno, who is at the climate conference in Dubai. She's going to report on what, well, this information does to her as a climate activist, and she will give us information on misinformation concerning climate change during the COP. And you can ask your questions to her after her small input, because afterwards she will need to join the uh, conference debates in Dubai again. Afterwards, we will welcome Alexandra Geza. We'll talk about why it is right now the time to um, become active, and she will also reflect on what we talked about during our first session. Our third guest is Katharina Schulze, who will talk about the last electoral campaign in Bavaria. And yeah, the rest of the time is reserved for you and your questions. Clara Duvigneau is 20 years old. She is a climate activist from Berlin and spokesperson for Fridays for Future in Germany. She's studying ecology and environmental planning at the Technical University of Berlin and is campaigning with Fridays for Future Germany for 1.5 degree compliant climate policy. Together with six other activists, she's part of the FFF Germany delegation at this year's climate conference in Dubai. Hello, thank you for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here. I'm in one of the huge conference rooms here in Dubai. And it's incredibly dynamic here. Lots of things are going on. Most of you have probably heard that yesterday evening a draft has been published. And it is absolutely catastrophic. It is far away from what we really need in order to tackle the climate crisis. And that is where I would like to start. If you look back, if you think about how Fridays for Future came about, then you always heard, listen to the science at the start. That was extremely important for our movement. Scientists for Future was a movement that was founded a subgroup of Fridays for Future or part of the For Future Alliance. And they confirmed that what we, the young people, the pupils said was incredibly relevant and important. When we started, it was completely normal for people, right wing populists to scream at the top of their lungs that the climate crisis should not be taken seriously in talk shows, that it's all not so bad and that we shouldn't be hysteric about things. After five years of Fridays for Future, things have changed. And actually on Friday, on the 15th of December, we'll celebrate the fifth anniversary of Fridays for Future, which is, which is completely absurd. And we managed to change and shift the narrative in Germany in a way where climate lies have become uncool. 
people can no longer afford to deny the climate crisis because it has become completely evident now that that is not the case. Science is showing us the truth. So it is not as common now to deny the climate crisis, but climate lies still exist in a changed version. The implementation and the urgence um, of changing things is denied. We need to start, we need to lower the emissions. The emissions need to reach their peak so that we will somehow manage to save our planet. So we need to reduce emissions. There's a lot at stake. We do not know what it would mean to live in a world that is two or three degrees warmer. We have forecasts, estimations, but we already see that with the existing increase in global temperatures, scientific assumptions have not been confirmed that the reality is worse sometimes than what scientists had postulated before. The terrible thing about this is that after 30 years of climate conferences, we still need to um, fight for exiting fossil fuels. But it is so obvious that the ITC report also says that we really need to exit fossil fuels, that that is the only way to stop climate change and to mitigate the climate crisis. It's a big challenge for us, and I'm sure this is the case for many of you. The new version of disinformation campaigns within the climate crisis discourse have become very difficult for us. People are no longer saying climate crisis does not exist. Instead, they say, well, we need to be open to technology. What about carbon capture? We can put it back into the soil nice ideas, but they are not implementable on the scale that we need. They pose threats, such as the displacement of in indigenous people, the destruction of nature. And so it seems like we will well, people have to change. People have to be bold enough to change. And the solutions that are being proposed here are not real solutions. Saying that this could work is a disinformation campaign. And all of this is bringing us into a situation in which people doubt whether we really need to exit fossil fuels. We're seeing this at the climate conference. More than 2,400 fossil fuel lobbyists are here. The register for lobbyists is a lot more exact than in the last years, but it is a lot higher than last year and a lot higher than in the last few years. And I think that is emblematic for the lobby, the fossil fuel lobby suddenly being quite scared. We saw a letter of oil exporting countries who clearly positioned themselves and they asked their own member states to speak against the exit from fossil fuels here. These developments reflect the world society. The world society's interest should be to exit fossil fuels and we see that atmosphere here, we can feel that. We were never as close to exiting fossil fuels as we are now. We are fighting and the fossil fuel industry is fighting against everyone else, essentially. That is what is happening here. The fossil fuel industry is very active when it comes to disinformation campaigns. The oil industry was the industry that spoke about the 1.5 degree 
theory first. They had great scientists that were funded by them and they issued warnings to people who issued these studies. But they profited, f they will profit if oil and gas is continually used, exported and consumed. Instead of warning our world population at a time where we still had a lot of time where we could have slowly but surely changed and adapted infrastructure and industries, they used disinformation campaigns instead. They introduced the carbon footprint. Many of you might know that from school. When I was in seventh or eighth grade in, in a German school, we spoke about the carbon footprint in geography. And she told us to find out about our own carbon footprint. And then you really are lost as a young person. You think that you are co-responsible somehow for the climate crisis. But what can you do? And the sensation you get is that every little detail counts. OK, I will use my bike. I will make sure to buy the right things when I go to the grocery shop and you might start blaming yourself too much and you completely lose sight of the big levers that really are responsible for the climate crisis. In the end, of course, it is a contribution to climate crisis. How do I live my personal life? But the large players, the energy industry has a much bigger impact if coal, oil and gas are still supported and, use, and used, then that, of course, is the biggest percentage point in emissions. And, of course, that massively contributes to the climate crisis. These are strategies the fossil lobby uses, which is why there is a lot of mistrust from our side that there will be any compromises because the lobby feels threatened. They are worried about their existence. They have lots of resources. And if I may just say one more thing, the COP president shocked everyone with a quote. He said that there is no science behind exiting fossil fuels, that that is not necessary scientifically to stick with the 1.5 degree limit, and that denies the realities of climate crisis. And it shows that disinformation campaigns are used. Yesterday's text was awful. We all hope that the text issued now is going to be an improvement. At the same time, of course, the standards have been lowered. So everything that comes now could be celebrated as a success. That cannot happen either. We have to exit fossil fuels. And that's my last sentence. Thank you, Clara. We lost your video, it seems. Your connection was a little difficult at times. I wanted to interrupt you anyway because we have a few questions in the chat and maybe you want to answer them. I will summarize it. The first question is about renewable energies and uh, wind powered um, power stations. And of course they can be a threat to different animals. Do you know about that at Fridays for Future? Sometimes that is an argument that is used against wind turbines. It's more of a statement, really, that the sites are used um, and selected after finding out more information about them. Maybe we can answer another question other afterwards, the legislation regarding climate in Germany. What do you think? Is that part of the public or political debate and what about the awareness of the public in Germany? Are you still on the line? I think Clara dropped out of the Zoom meeting unfortunately. Oh no, just in the right moment unfortunately, says Zora. Let's wait, maybe, can, maybe Clara can join again in a second. Maybe she'll be back in a second. If not, I might introduce our next guest. And if Clara is back, we can continue seamlessly 
So let's continue with Alexandra Giese. Clara is back. Oh, Clara is back. In that case, let's start again. Clara, can you hear us? We just came to the questions. Yes, I'm sorry. I think I will turn off my video. I think that's better to keep a stable internet connection. Yes, we couldn't hear you that well. But did you hear the questions? Unfortunately, I did not. Could you please repeat them? I will summarize them. The example wind turbines. They can threaten or affect animals and their living space. Does Fridays for Future know about this? Is there awareness for this problem in your movement that these sites are selected? I don't think that that is meant as a criticism against renewable energies, just that it can be instrumentalized by people who are against renewable energies. That was one question. The second question regarding climate laws in Germany and whether they have impacted the awareness of citizens and the political debate. What do you think about that? Let's speak about birds and wind turbines. I th turbines. I think many people have ha have uh, thought about that, and I don't think that Fridays for Future can find a final solution for that. It's completely misused, as you just said, by people who are against renewables. Of course, we have to get people on board on site. They need to participate in the processes, in the approval processes as well, the local, po the local population. But we cannot accept excuses or minor things. We cannot allow that to delay the climate solutions. We need to take care of diversity, biological diversity, but we need to take care of it in other places as well, in agriculture, for instance, or in urban areas. We need to do a lot more for diversity there, and we should not use it as an excuse to slow down the um, green transition. Now, let's speak about the second question. I think Fridays for Future made a big contribution to the act on climate change. First, it was not sufficient, so we spoke about that, we lamented it. And of course, it's an ongoing process. The courts are looking at the case. I think many are confused and insecure because of the, um, the way things have been going. The interpreter apologizes, the sound has gone. We cannot hear you well now, says Sora. Can you hear me now? Hello? Yes, now we can hear you. I'm sorry, the Wi-Fi here is quite terrible. What did you hear? You said that the Climate Act was quite ambitious and where it was not, you lamented it and then we stopped hearing you. The Climate Act is sort of a Fridays for Future Act. Now the industry targets are being changed again. And I think that that is the wrong message for people in Germany. We really need to get started when it comes to climate protection. We need to be active and we need to do this in a way that those in our society who have the least are not disadvantaged. So we need to make sure that those who have more have to do more than those who have less. And I think that the legislation at the moment is 
giving the impression that that it would restrict people in their personal liberties. That is what is being propagated. And so we need to act and take action with good legislation. That also means that people who don't have as much have to contribute less than people who have a lot. Okay, thank you, Clara. We got your answers, but to stay with our, within our time frame, I would like to thank you. And of course, you can stay with us as long you are able to. And I would like to move on with our second speaker, Alexandra Gese. She has been member of the European Parliament since 2019. For the Greens EFA group, she negotiated the Digital Services Act to regulate digital platforms and social networks. She has been deputy group chair since 2022, and her priorities are democracy in the digital age, sustainable digitization, and gender equality. She's a member of the Committee on Budgets and the Committee on the Internal Market and Consumer Protection. Dear Alexandra, the floor is yours. And you can also, of course, uh, add to the questions that were asked in the chat. Yes, thank you for having me today. The first question you asked me was why is climate or um, the fight against climate um, disinformation is so important today? It is so important because we are really setting the stage in order to be able to still reach the 1.5 degrees um, target. Fridays for Future managed five years ago to change the narrative in Germany as well as in Europe. In 2018, 2019, we had this strong Fridays for Future movement that set the stage and the awareness on or how important it is to um, mitigate climate change. We had huge um, successes of the Green Party in Europe. Um, we well, we're able to agree on stricter climate goals, this Green Deal, this measure package that helps us to reach those goals. All this was achieved. We also started to, well, introduce, uh, well, climate or industri industrial transformation. Now, for example, in the rural area in Germany to um, produce green steel, but all this is not sufficient because, well, we need to do more and now climate disinformation and well interests of the fossil energy not lobby lead to well having important decision makers take another stance now the evp the christian democrats in europe say that they do not want any laws anymore any acts that would mean changes or transformations for industry in germany we see the narrative that people it is, we must not ask too much of the people this is bad for climate protection and very bad for the german industry because in china and the us they uh, advance at um, a fast pace all this has um, well practical implications for politics. We have um, a narrative on well deaccelerating climate progress, and those um, influencing groups have been very successful in doing that. And I would like to give you some examples on that. First, classical example is not in my backyard so do something yes but not here in my backyard not here where i am that is an argument that is brought forward by conservatives a lot because they say in germany well germany only accounts for two percent of the climate emissions and germany has one percent of the world population so two percent is one percent too much isn't it and then we see the argument that large countries such as China, if you look at the per capita emissions, um, it is much, much more what we do here, what we emit in Germany when comparing to India or China. And if only large countries need to implement measures, what would that mean to for Germany as the largest country in the European Union? 
So climate protection is necessary everywhere, not only in other spots or other places. The second narrative we know quite well is this um, deacceleration, which is this idea of being open to technologies, to new technologies. A good example is, for example, the combustion engine. So a decision taken on the EU level was re start people started to renegotiate it again just in order to somehow have the combustion engine move on while the world has progressed much more in china there are much stricter regulations for combustion engines and also for the quota on electric vehicles that need to be put into the market by the producers and in the US, Tesla is the largest um, EV producer in the world. Um, well, they are leading the field. So open to technology, yes, but what is the aim? What and what makes sense in that context? We do not have that many resources in Germany and we need to concentrate them on areas where they make sense. The third narrative that is very, very strong in Germany is the following only individual measures instead of um, statewide coordination. So what is done is climate protection is put on the shoulders of the individual citizen that, of course, make part of a system and systemic changes are needed. And this needs to be coordinated by the government. And a good example, practical example in this respect is the heating law. The, it was an act on heating against um, um, heat pumps that was started, although all experts know that heat pumps are the best and most cost efficient um, um, instruments in order to reduce um, um, emissions from buildings and from the built environment. And well, the measure, the act was that uh, the idea of this law, of this proposed law was to replace inefficient heating systems by more efficient ones and by heat pumps. But this was turned to a completely different message by disinformation, misinformation, saying that people are not allowed to use their old heating systems anymore from the next year onwards. So which was complete, which were complete lies, of course. So in Germany, this was the turning point of public sentiment. It started with the Springer Media Group, the Bild tabloid, reported pages and pages with misinformation on this heating act. Um, the end was the large um, Spiegel um, first page, cover page, where Robert Habeck, the Ministry of um, Economy, where he's uh, wearing a, a well, a blue working coat, and uh, while repairing the um, his heating um, system in in the basement. So the idea was that everybody would have to take his heating system out of the house, and this would be an uh, well type of um, well intrusion into private life. Then the Welt newspaper talked about the heat pump would destroy culture or the cultural values in Germany. And this leads me to the next narrative. The social implications are too high. Also, social implications of climate protection measures. This is something that is only brought forward by people who don't want any statewide coordination. Co uh, coordination. So social implications can be mitigated if you have a good control system um, and if you have statewide coordination, but CDO, you and the liberals in Germany do not want this. They don't want to have a more targeted tax incentive system. They always say, well, all this is much too expensive for the individual citizen. I would like to give you a short resume on what we said during the last, the first session, but you still have one minute to do that. Okay, so I would like to get to another topic, maybe, which is um, hate speech in the social networks. Once one part of the strategy of the anti-climate activists on the worldwide level, right-wing conservatives, also um, other groups, radical groups, who on their web pages um, use misinformation and they also use a lot of hate speech against climate activists. It is about politicians that are active in the climate arena. It is about activists, but also meteorologists scientists that are attacked heavily here in Germany and are threatened. They are, well, tried to 
also physical um, violence is being used. And if you think, for example, violence against those people that are demonstrating on the streets, they are attacked by car drivers, for example. Defamation, if you think about uh, Ms. Neubauer or stones thrown at people during an electoral campaign, this is something that is being kicked off in the social networks and in the internet in order to make people not talk anymore and, well, mute themselves because they're afraid of being victim of hate and violence. And we know from scientist research that this aggressivity and this hate in the, in the, on the internet leads to physical violence in the real world. That is something we can observe. And this is not only an attack to climate protection, but also to the democratic system in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. And now from Dubai. Um, in Strasbourg, Brussels, we go to Bavaria. Katharina Schulze is the face of the Bavarian Greens and has been the leader of the parliamentary group in the Bavarian state parliament since 2017 as the Green opposition leader. Katharina covets that the love of freedom and a sense of responsibility go wonderfully well together. You can't make the world a better place by complaining. You have to make it better, is her political compass, which she uses to inspire people throughout Bavaria to get them involved in politics. About two months ago, the state elections were held in Bavaria, and Katharina will tell us about her experience. Yes, thank you. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me today. And thanks to the two ladies who talked before me, because I can give you some information from my practical day to day work. Who did not follow the electoral campaign in Bavaria? We in Bavaria, as the Green Party, we had three main topics during our electoral campaign. Two of them related to climate and environmental protection. We fight. We were in favor of um, faster um, scale up of renewable energies, and we had our slogan saying um, "Vote for the climate" instead of voting for the crisis. So those were our topics um, during our electoral campaign. And what was the result? We, the Greens, had 14.4%. AFD surpassed up with 14.6%. The Free Freien Wähler with more, and CSU with 37%. SPD got 8.4% in Bavaria. And this result of the um, Bavarian elections was a good mirror of the well of the sentiment in our federal state because as Alexandra already explained, environment, climate protection was um, a buzzword, but not in a way that we were looking for the best solutions possible um, and trying to save and protect our planet. But those topics were used in discussions in order to talk about this heating law that would ruin everybody, that is extremely expensive, that people would not be allowed to heat their houses anymore. So this targeted disinformation of a climate protection measure and a measure that is also makes sense from a social politics point of view to switch from fossils to renewables. This is um, something that makes people to, well, have cheaper energy in the future so that you don't have an old and obsolete and expensive heating in your basement anymore in the years to come. So those misinformation campaigns were fueled by different groups. So we didn't get into a position to talk about our targets and our measures that we proposed because we had to deal with all of this um, well those misinformation and um, well bad arguments first and the candidate who was also the um, minister in the barrier Marcus Söger, warned people in a speech um, about a pending 300,000 euros um, 
um, hammer that is hanging above the people's head and that will fall on them. Um, and he was talking about the heating law, of course. So he fueled fear um, with people who knew that they had an old heating system in the building. So during this electoral campaign in Bavaria, we as the Green Party were somehow squeezed into a corner of the room, people doing things that we were only trying to, well, do our or implement our ideology. Um, and that we wanted to prohibit and to limit um, personal freedom for us as a party and for our members this it was a very intense and difficult campaign because this disinformation campaign is not only happening in the digital world so it was not that we found hatred and um well bad measures insulting measures um in emails or on the internet but this defamation campaign and those lies and well was or transposed from the digital to the real world we had personal attacks we had physical attacks on green members who were putting um, um were putting information material we had a tent in keeming um where tomatoes, stones, and um, um, eggs were sold in front of our tent where we wanted to have a small event. And then in order to be thrown to the stage, the police reacted in a good way and who threw a stone was then arrested afterwards. And um, well, there's an investigation um, against those people that was introduced. And one person that is as part of the Reichsbürger, which is a radical group in Germany. Well, he was arrested. Well, but this campaign that is, well, promoted on the internet transposes to the um, real life. And my experience from the electoral campaign is that things become more difficult where when other democratic parties also, well, participate in this disinformation campaign because this leads to a shift of realities and truth if facts are no longer recognized as being factual if everybody creates his own um, reality and truth we do not only lose on the term um, of um, well climate protection but we lose also when it comes to our democratic basis which is based on a discussion that is uh, well founded on truth and on facts. And during our campaign in Bavaria, we had a shift um, while well, people lost respect. Um, there was a loss of respect. There was a loss of um, reliance on truth and on reality and on facts. And this led to a lurch to the right um, for the result, and not only the AFD um, reached its best result in history in Bavaria, and it really um, put damaged de de democracy in general. So that was my report from Bavaria. Thank you, Katarina. Thank you. Thank you for the interesting inputs i think it's sad how much we actually need to analyze the disinformation now we have received quite a few questions and comments in our q and a tool i might summarize it a little for you and of course feel free to react the first question from tiffany chan about the climate legislation in germany and whether politicians are better able to work against climate disinformation in Germany thanks to that legislation. She also refers to the heating law. Would anyone like to answer that directly? Yes, I would like to begin, says Katharina Schulze. 
the good thing about democracy is that the majority in parliament can change the reality and that is of course the responsibility of politics to tackle challenges and to show how to solve it. The problems arise when, especially looking at Bavaria, when you have a government which, which is not interested in that at all. By the way, the free state of Bavaria has a coalition contract where they wrote that Bavaria wants to be climate neutral by 2040, so five years, oh, Alexander is laughing, five years before the Federal Republic of Germany. And yes, that's great. Papers are patient. I can write anything on a paper. I can write on a paper that I'll start running from tomorrow because rationally I know that it's great to do more exercise. However, if I do not do that, if I don't regularly put on my running shoes and start running, if I don't train, I will never be able to run for five kilometers without collapsing. And I think that is the problem. The problem is that mere targets don't help. If you do not have any laws, any binding laws, any monitoring, any industry targets as to how you want to reach your ambitious climate law, with the example here of Bavaria, climate free or climate neutral by 2040. Alexandra, would you like to add anything? Yes. The question was how you can make it a legal restriction. So what you can do legally, I think the first thing is to not spread climate disinformation because we know that that will increase the reach of those accounts. Um, the, politic the political accounts are going to um, you know, spread that. We just saw that the number of 300,000 euros, you know, someone like Söder shares that and he's a an important public political person and he sort of legitimizes it and then people think it's true so the first thing to do is not to spread those contents but to use scientifically proven content regarding legislation it's not that easy to take action against that we want a law that differentiates between lies and the truth because there are a lot of gray zones so it's it is quite difficult but we do have an act on digital services um, because one of the reasons why disinformation is doing so well is because it's so successful on the, in the internet. I didn't actually speak about that in the last episode, I think, but there are algorithms on the internet which ensure that lies and disinformation, so anything that would trigger fear and anger in people, would be shown to many more people, a, a lot more people than scientific facts. So you have to actually target people with scientific evidence. You have to really promote it in a targeted way. However, lies, things that incite fear, for example, a heat pump is 300,000 euros and you won't be allowed to heat from next year onwards. That causes fear. People click on it and the algorithm learns, oh, that's great. We need to show that lots of to lots of people because people love it. This algorithm, which assesses lies and disinformation much better than facts, scientific facts, can be followed up on. There is a law now which is called Act on Digital Services. The scope is quite complex, it's not that, stra not that straightforward. But the European Commission, for instance, can tell the big internet concerns that certain algorithms can no longer um, keep going on the way they are, that they want to get more information about them and more transparency. And doing that would help us enormously um, to fight against climate disinformation because people are making a lot of money with it. It's not only due to political interests, it's just also because uh, if you have disinformation on your website, you will make a lot of money with ads. So those are real money makers, cash cows, and that is a problem that could be solved. It might also kind of correlate to another question where Michaela Reitinger asked, the question might be naive, but what is the concrete interest or the benefit, for instance, of the Springer Press or the Spiegel journalism media to actually get involved in the disinformation campaigns? Is that a question of financing or money because that way you'll be able to get more money in from ads? Or why are, they, why are large media outlets getting involved? Alexandra, you're nodding. Is that approval? Yes, uh, so it is due to money. I would make a differentiation between Springer and Spiegel. Springer 
has shareholders in private equity hedge funds, so investment funds, which of course are strongly investing in fossil fuels. So the owners of the Springer um, media outlet outlet are interested in sharing disinformation information which is good for fossil fuels bad for in renewables um, however all media outlets are also financed by the clicks their articles get on the internet that applies for springer but also for spiegel i don't think spiegel has any political interest regarding fossil fuels i do not think so there are great columns in the spiegel which show a completely different picture but of course the spiegel also needs to be visible in the social media um, sphere and of course the algorithms dictate the visibility on social media and if facebook instagram twitter um, gives those things more visibility then of course that impacts the income of these media outlets that's a problem nowadays that the press is no longer independent it really is controlled by social media because they control the ads and they decide who gets the ad, who gets the money thank you i would like to move on we have quite a few questions and statements which are coming up the next question from Annika regarding the culture wars. What about a culturally open Germany, for example, regarding humanitarian refugee politics? How is that interlinked with, interlinked with the hostility we are speaking about regarding climate change? And advocates, why is that? Yes, there are, is quite a lot of scientific knowledge about that research has been conducted regarding that issue. The elections have shown that a certain party is actually speaking to people who do not like the changes for any reasons. They don't want to see those changes happening. And of course, if you're active in climate change, that means to change things so we can live in the future. So th that means that we have to do things differently. Society has to keep developing. That's one of the implications there. So there will be changes, of course. The life, your life will change. The society will change. Politics will change. The AFD in Germany has a certain business model where they always say the opposite and do the opposite of the public discourse. And so they try and get as many voters as possible with that tactic. So you see that people are kind of jumping. People who are against refugees or were against refugees are also against climate protection, against empowerment of women. And then they mix all of that and they connect it. Uh, culture wars is added as another layer to that. And one thing that troubles me most, that um, really makes me question what to do, is that we know these mechanisms from other countries. All we have to do is look into other countries, in the US for example, or in other European countries, and we can see the playbook of right-wing populism. Free press is, um, so the press of lies, is legitimated. Institutions are labelled not important. They say there is no de democracy, and those up there in the parliament, all they're doing is talking. Institutions are attacked police officers disinformation is spread they uh, make a difference between us the people and them up there the elite we know that from other countries and that is happening in germany too that is why i think it is even more dangerous that if democratic competitors also use that just a little or completely if they are surfing that wave as well because of course that is going to eradicate our democracy if someone like the governor of bavaria presents um, disinformation regarding the act on heating so how do you want to proceed as a political force to or in order to as alexandra Geza said to do true or to keep the truth in politics so if that strat tactic is followed by many politicians then i think it will be very dangerous and i think that is the responsibility of all political parties 
because the climate movement or the Greens cannot be alone in this. They need to work together. All democratic forces need to work together, liberal ones, progressive ones, conservative ones, and the Greens. We all need to recognize that our democracy is in, in danger. And if we don't stick together in that uh, regard, even if we might diverge when it comes or have different opinions when it comes to the content of our politics, well, then the problem will be much larger. And I can't see that much happening in that regard at the moment, but I think we urgently need to stick together. I think the question regarding the 1 million euros is um, meant in a way where they ask how good communication can work, how that can look regarding climate change. We see a lot of climate disinformation against the act on heating, for instance. Sibylla Brown asked that question, by the way. She says that that meant that EU directives are not implemented correctly anymore. She speaks about building standards for new building, for, in, for example, from the EU building or construction directive. Do you have any input regarding how to counteract these narratives or how to better deal with uh, initiatives for the climate change? We've got another... Um, or for the climate protection, we've got another question regarding uh, ads for fossil fuels that should be prohibited in a different country. Is something similar planned in Germany? Do you know that? That's an example from France, by the way. Regarding the prohibition of the prohibition the prohibition of advertisements for fossil fuels, I don't know about that. I don't know about that either. However, France has a very strong atomic industry or f um, nuclear industry, and so they don't have as many problems with the fossil fuel industry. Uh, so they're not only pushing that, they're pushing their own nuclear energy on the market as an alternative to fossil fuels. So I'd be a little cautious with France in that regard. Now regarding communication, specifically on the act on heating, I think that the problem with the act on heating was that um, they leaked a draft before we could actually take the social part on board. So I think that that's something we should have done. And I think that that's what was planned. They wanted to clearly state how it should be financed and how the state will support people uh, who cannot afford a heat pump. So social implications should have been explained and you have to do that when you speak about the measure before and not afterwards and not several weeks afterwards. I think that was the big problem there. You must avoid people being made to feel insecure. Once you uh, introduce a measure you need to clearly state how that is going to be financed and that no one who cannot afford it will have to pay for it all by themselves and they should also have emphasized what that means for landlords. Maybe there are not that many in Bavaria but in Germany 50% of people rent other people rent as well and that should have been crystallized much more how people with lower income can be supported and protected of explosive energy costs. Regarding the building guideline, that's correct. We would have liked a stricter guideline or directive at the start and we saw that in Germany as well. To have it on a European level and to implement that on a European level would have been great, but it's a great directive anyway. All of these are good options and we need that. We need positive communication. However, that does not change the fact that we need to look at the mechanisms, the global communications. Um, we need to change those algorithms, those patterns, because those algorithms contribute to the fact that disinformation is viewed 10 times more often than scientific facts. So we need to regulate the internet. We need legislation. We already have the basis, but we need to implement and enforce it. That needs to be changed so we get good climate information. There are a lot of good um, scientifically based and backed uh, facts and those need to be more visible and that's why it's so important that we speak about it. We also need to know that the law exists and that we can now do something against that. Thank you. Um, I have one question on the e European Parliament elections um, next year and I would like to ask um, somebody from German what 
EV, asked whether we can see a stronger right-wing spectrum or even a repositioning of the EVP um, to move away from the European Green Deal. Could you maybe give us some additional information on that? Yes, this is a very, very um, real danger. We expect a strengthening of both right-wing um, um, parliamentary groups here in the European Parliament. So it is the case, and the Christian Democrats still are somehow divided. Ursula von Leyen was one of the promoters of the European Green Deal, but the strengthening of the right-wing spectrum is something that we expect to see on the European level as, um, as well. And we will see more misinformation in the area of anti-feminism, LGBTQ, um, climate protection, and so on. So we will see a lot of disinformation there, and that, which is why I, under, I only can subscribe what Katarina said, that we need a very large and unified alliance. It cannot be the Greens alone to do this. We need to have this civil society on board to organize itself and understand well how those me mechanisms work and how misinformation is being spread. We also need to work closely with journalists to um, work together with associations and um, non-governmental institutions in order and well we are very very active in talking with German Vox, uh, German um, watch um, with this institution that asked the question here so it is uh, one of the important tasks of the civil society to uncover those mechanisms and make them understandable for the individual citizens and of course we also need to stand up one thing is to analyze, but um, those who do not want to see progress, future change, are very good in share all the content being produced by AFD, for example. Solidarity is key in this respect. Everybody you once was the victim of a shitstorm. If you, if it's happened to you once, you really have to be very, very tough in order to really dare and go out to the stage again as a politician, as an activist. That is something that happens also to volunteers in uh, in a local association. For example, if they stand up and if you will, are victim of a shitstorm, something that helps you a lot is solidarity with other people and sometimes i understand why people say the internet is so crazy and until alexandra has done everything well with her digital services act i try to not involve myself anymore but this means that we we'll leave the ground to other groups and my wish my desire would be especially when looking into the future at the European elections, to see how we as a societal group, as a civic organization, can help to bring those aims that we have um, into the forefront of our minds. This is a wonderful claim, and I think this is a good start of the end of our online session. Thank you very much for being here today. Thanks to all the participants for this active participation, all the questions. We didn't manage to answer them all, but we'll have another session on the 22nd of January, and we are going to talk about how can we protect ourselves and take action against disinformation on the climate crisis as an individual citizens. I would like to invite you to um, participate as well. It will be moderated by Veran Meyer, my colleague. Thanks to everybody, to our speakers, and also to Anja and John from the Brussels team, my colleagues, our technical support, and the interpreters as well. Now I wish you all a wonderful afternoon and hope to meet you back again in January. Thank you and bye-bye.